So if you have a five to four perspective decision, does one of the justices go to the another justice and say, why don't you change your mind? Does that work very much? Or? No, there's no horse trading at the court. You've also gotten a lot of attention for your exercise uh, regime. When it comes time to meet my trainer, I drop everything. Many people think that the court is very political. People have that view because Agreement isn't interesting. Disagreement is. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist. And nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? Let me ask you a question uh, at the beginning. How does it feel to get up in the morning and know that 330 million Americans want to know the state of your health that day? How does it feel encouraging? As cancer survivors know, that dread disease is a challenge, and it helps to know that people are rooting for you. Now, it's not universal. <laughs> when, <laughs> when I had pancreatic cancer in 2009, there was a senator whose name I don't recall, but he said I would be dead within six months. That senator is now no longer alive. But you can't remember his name. <laughs> no, I don't remember his name. Uh, but your current view is that as long as you're healthy and able to do the job, you intend to stay on the court. Is that correct? As long as I'm healthy and mentally agile. Okay. So, now, Justice Stevens and later, and previously, Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, they retired when they were 90. Would you like to break their record, or any thought about that? I spent the first week in July with Justice Stevens in what turned out to be the last week of his life. He was remarkable. He was 99 years old. Since he left the court at age 90, he has written four books. So yes, he's my role model. So um, today, uh, many people think that the court is very political, that people appointed to the court by Democratic presidents and those appointed by Republican presidents tend to follow the political desires of the Republican or Democratic Party. Do you think that's a fair assessment? And why do you think, if it's not fair, people have that view? People have that view because agreement isn't interesting. Disagreement is, so the press tends to play up our 5-4 or our 5-3 decisions. But if we can take just last term as a typical example, we had 68 decisions after full briefing and argument. Of those, 20 were 5-4 or 5-3 divisions, but 29 were unanimous. So we agree more often than we sharply disagree. And that's something I would like the audience to take away, that the divisions, yes, they are on some very important questions, but our agreement rate is always higher than our disagreement rate. So if you have a five to four perspective decision, does one of the justices go to the another justice and say, why don't you change your mind? Does that work very much? Or? No, there's no horse trading at the court. Nobody it, says, if you vote for me on this one, I'll vote for you on that one. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it never happens, but we are constantly trying to persuade each other. And most often, we do it through our writing. Every time I write a dissent for four, 
I am hopeful that I can pick up a fifth vote. Many people are surprised that the civility that exists between justices, even though they write not such favorable things about each other. So for example, Justice Scalia used to say not such wonderful things about your views, and you then still went to the opera with him. Was that a little mm -hmm. awkward or hard to do? And not at all. And Justice Scalia and I became friends when we were buddies on the DC circuit. What did I love most about him? His infectious sense of humor. When we were three judges on the Court of Appeals, he'd sometimes whisper something to me. It would crack me up. I had all I could do to contain hysterical laughter. But we had much in common. True, our styles were very different, but both of us cared a lot about writing opinions so that at least other lawyers and judges will understand what we were saying. Both of you uh, were, and you still are, a great uh, opera lover. Where did you get your love of opera to begin with, and where did the opera Scalia Ginsburg come from? Mm -hmm. I'll take the first question first. My love of opera began when I was 11 years old. I was in grade school in Brooklyn, New York. My aunt, who was a middle school, junior high school English teacher, took me to a high school in Brooklyn where an opera was being performed. It was La Gioconda, not a likely choice for a first opera. There was a man at the time named Dean Dixon, whose mission in life was to turn children on to beautiful music. And he had an all-city orchestra. He took opera performances around to various schools, condensed them into one hour, narrated in between. There were costumes, bare staging. So my introduction to opera was thanks to Dean Dixon in 1944. So the Scalia Ginsburg opera was written by a, a law school student? He was then a law school student. He was a music major at Harvard and a master's in music from Yale. Derek Wang is his name. He decided it would be useful to know something about the law. So he enrolled in his hometown law school with the University of Maryland. And in his second year, he took a constitutional law course. He read these dueling opinions, Scalia on one side, Ginsburg on the other, and decided this could make a very funny opera. <laughs> so I'll just give you a taste of Scalia Ginsburg. It opens with Scalia's rage aria. It's an aria. <laughs> very Handelian in style. And he sings, the justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. <laughs> and then in my coloratura soprano voice, I answer, dear Justice Scalia, you are searching for bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that like our society, it can evolve. <laughs> so that, that sets up the difference between us. The plot of Scalia Ginsburg is roughly based on the magic flute. <laughs> and, and, Scalia is locked up in a dark room. He's being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> I then emerge through a glass ceiling. <laughs> uh, to, to help him pass the tests he needs to pass to get out of the dark room. Then a character left over from Don Giovanni, the commentatore, <laughs> is astonished. He said, 
He's your enemy. Why would you want to help him? And I sing, he's not my en enemy, he's my dear friend. And then we sing a wonderful duet <laughs> that goes, we are different, we are one. Different in our approach to reading legal texts, but one in our reverence for the Constitution and for the institution we serve. You are extremely well known around the country now, but you weren't when you went on the court, but now you've become more or less a rock star, uh, RBG and... When I was asked, well, what in the world do you have in common with the notorious B.I.G.? I said, it's obvious. So uh, most justices of the Supreme Court are relatively not recognized by the public, I would say. Uh, maybe in recent years that's changed a little bit, but you are extremely well known around the country now, but you weren't when you went on the court, but now you've become more or less a rock star, uh, <laughs> RBG, and you have movies about you on the basis of sex and other things. So uh, why do you think this has occurred, and is this something you don't really enjoy that much, or do you something you just think comes with the territory now? How was the notorious RBG created? <laughs> it was the idea of a second year student at NYU Law School who was very disappointed in the court's decision in the Shelby County case. And that was a case in which the court declared unconstitutional the key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, an act that had been renewed time and again by overwhelming majorities, both sides of the aisle. But the Supreme Court struck down the formula. The way the Voting Rights right, Act worked was if you were a state or a city or a county that kept African Americans from voting in the not so good old days, you could not make any change in voting legislation unless you pre-cleared it with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division or with a three-judge district court in the District of Columbia. So that advanced check suppressed many laws that would have discouraged African Americans from voting. The Supreme Court said, well, the formula for who was discriminating in 1965 is now out of date. Congress needs to do it over because Jurisdictions that were discriminating in 1965 may have clean hands today. The political problem was what member of Congress, what senator, what representative would stand up and say, my state or my city or my county is still discriminating, so keep it under the surveillance that the Voting Rights Act provides. It just wasn't going to happen. The act itself had a bailout provision. So if a state, city, county indeed had clean hands for several elections, it could bail out. And that device, I thought, was, right. was all that was needed but in any event, the student was disturbed about the court's decision. She was angry. And then she said to herself, anger is not a useful emotion. I'm going to do something positive. And what she did was she took the announcement of my dissent that I read from the bench in Shelby County 
and she created this blog, hitting at the notorious RBG, a name she got from a well-known rapper who was called <laughs> the notorious B.I.G. And when I was asked, well, what in the world do you have in common with the notorious B.I.G.? I said, it's obvious. <laughs> Both of us were born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. So. Now, you uh, were born and bred in Brooklyn. You have still a bit of a Brooklyn accent, you might admit. Um, you were played in a movie by Felicity Jones, who was not Jewish or from Brooklyn. <laughs> so how do you think she did? I thought she was fantastic. When I first met Felicity, I said, you speak the Queen's English. How are you going to sound like a girl born and bred in Brooklyn? Well, she listened to many tapes of my speeches, um, my arguments at, at the court, and she, and she was wonderful. So in recent years, you've also gotten a lot of attention for your exercise uh, yeah. regime. Yeah. So when did that start? And you have your own trainer, and are you still you know, lifting weights or whatever you're doing? As recently as Tuesday. Um, it, I have been with the same personal trainer since 1999 when I had my first cancer bout, I had colorectal cancer. And my dear husband said, after going through surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, I looked like a survivor of Auschwitz. He said, you must do something to build yourself up. Get a personal trainer. And that's when I started in 1999. Sometimes I get so absorbed in my work, I just don't want to let go. But when it comes time to meet my trainer, I drop everything. Right. And as tired as I may be in the beginning, I always feel much better when we finish. Did Marty's mother ever give you any advice when you met her about how to uh, she, be happily married? She gave me some wonderful advice. We were married in her home. And she said, dear, I'd like to tell you the secret of a happy marriage. Okay, so you met your husband, Marty. You were married for 56 years. Yes. And you met him at Cornell, is that right? Yes, I met when I was 17 and he was 18. And uh, what is the likelihood of a woman at Cornell meeting somebody they marry and that person wants to take care of child rearing and also uh, cooking um, as well as sharing all the other burdens of being married? Is that a very common thing in your observation? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it was extraordinary at any time, but particularly in the 1950s. Cornell, by the way, had a four to one ratio, four men to every woman. It was the place parents want to send their daughters. <laughs> See, if you couldn't find your man at Cornell, you were hopeless. <laughs> so then I met Marty, and he was, in fact, the first boy I ever knew who cared that I had a brain. He was always my biggest booster. The cooking, oh, that began, I had two years between college and law school when Marty was in service. Those two years we spent in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the principal artillery base. I got pregnant during the first year. And when I ba went back to New York to give birth, my cousin sent Marty a copy of the Escoffier cookbook, an English translation, and said, this will give you something to do while your wife is away. 
So Monty had originally been a chemistry major at Cornell. And he treated this Escoffier cookbook like a chemistry textbook. He started with the basic stocks and worked his way through it. He gave up chemistry because it interfered with golf practice while he was a great golfer. And then he switched to government, which is, was my major. He attributed his, his skill in the kitchen to two women, his mother and his wife. His mother, I think, was that was an unfair judgment, but he was certainly right about me. <laughs> I had one cookbook. It was called The 60 Minute Chef, and that meant from when you enter the apartment till when it's on the table, no more than 60 minutes. I had seven things that I made, and we got to number seven. We went back to number one. So did Marty's mother ever give you any advice when you met her about how to uh, she, be happily married? She gave me some wonderful advice. We were married in her home, and she said, just before the ceremony started, dear, I'd like to tell you the secret of a happy marriage. I'd love to hear it. What is it? Every now and then, she said, it helps to be a little deaf. <laughs> Which was such wonderful advice. I've followed it assiduously to this very day. Right. It's how I'm dealing with my colleagues. As some oh. If an unkind word is said, I just tune out. So as a result of your marriage uh, to Marty, uh, who was a distinguished law professor and tax lawyer as well, you have two children. Jane, a da your daughter, it teaches at Columbia. She is the Morton L. Jack Lowe Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia right. Law School. Right. And as I understand it, uh, you and she were the only mother-daughter team to ever actually be elected to the Harvard Law Review. Is that true? So far. So far. Uh, oh. uh, and uh, you have a son who's in the music business? James makes exquisite compact discs. James grew up with a passion for music, but no talent as a performer. Oh. So when he went to the University of Chicago, he was the classical disc jockey on the student radio station. Then in the years he was dropping in and out of law school, he was also making recordings. And one day he told us he liked what he was doing uh, much more than his law classes. So we said, fine, that's what you want to do. Right. And today his label is CD, and his recordings are gems. So do you have any grandchildren? I have four grandchildren, two step-grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Okay. And what do your, uh, your grandchildren call you, RBG, or what do they call you? I'm a Jewish grandmother, so I'm called Bubby. Okay. From the Harvard Law Review and the Columbia Law Review, you were flooded with job offers from the major <laughs> law firms. <laughs> there wasn't a single firm in the entire city of New York that would take a chance on me.